Welcome back to day six in our study of the life of the Apostle Paul. Our title today is Saul's Conversion. Our reading comes from Acts chapter 22. We'll begin reading in verse 6 down through verse 16. As I was on my way and drew near to Damascus, about noon, a great light from heaven suddenly shone around me. And I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And I answered, Who are you, Lord? And he said to me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. Now those who were with me saw the light, but did not understand the voice of the one who was speaking to me. And I said, What shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said to me, Rise and go into Damascus, and there you will be told all that is appointed for you to do. And since I could not see because of the brightness of that light, I was led by the hand by those who were with me, and came into Damascus. And one Ananias, a devout man according to the law, well spoken of by all the Jews who lived there, came to me, and standing by me, said to me, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very hour I received my sight and saw him. And he said, The God of our fathers appointed you to know his will, to see the righteous one, and to hear a voice from his mouth. For you will be a witness for him to everyone of what you have seen and heard. And now, why do you wait? Rise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. Do you have a favorite part of the life that you like to tell people? Was it from a time in your youth? time in your early adulthood, a significant event. Do you always tell it the same way? Do you include certain items, events, or people at times, and at other times leave them out? Well, such is the nature of telling stories of our past. As humans, we may have a rather selective memory. We may embellish certain parts, perhaps making us a larger part of the overall memory. We may greatly exaggerate some elements. My wife and children like to rib me about some stories I tell. They might take on the stuff of legends, like fish stories, where the one that got away was of monstrous proportions, or golfing excursions, where my drives were the stuff of PGA champions. Maybe a twinge of exaggeration, but what can we do with the human memory that softens with time? In our account today from Acts 22, we have the second of three times that Paul's conversion is told. If we lay these side by side, we certainly recognize them as being the same incident. Scoffers and skeptics like to point out the inconsistencies of the account. But are there inconsistencies? Is Paul stretching the facts? Did Luke get it right? All these are easily answered and explained by the circumstances that Paul finds himself. The first account we read is from the third person of Luke, recording the events in Acts chapter 9. Since Luke was not there, he is telling the account based on what he has been told. For that is the purpose in writing these things. He begins in Luke chapter 1 and verse 1 through 4 by telling us, Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us. It seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may have certainty concerning the things that you have been taught. The purpose of Luke writing these things? that you may have certainty concerning the things you have been taught, in verse 4. This carries over into the book of Acts, since Luke spends a considerable amount of time with Paul, beginning in Acts chapter 16 and verse 11 at Troas. It is no doubt accurate. Briefly, let's consider the work of the Holy Spirit in the writing of the New Testament. In the Gospel of John chapter 14, verses 25 and 26, these things I have spoken to you while I am still with you. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, 
he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. And again in the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verses 30 and 31. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. And finally from the Gospel of John, chapter 21 and verse 24. This is the disciple who is bearing witness about these things and who has written these things. And we know that his testimony is true. Consider what Peter wrote in his letters, 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 16. For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. And concerning Paul's writings, Peter says in 2 Peter 3, 15 and 16, And count the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given him as he does in all his letters when he speaks in them of these matters. There are some things in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction, as they do other scriptures. How do we get scripture? Peter says in 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21, Knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of scripture came from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man. But men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Luke is moved by the Holy Spirit to record these events for us. The first account is to give us the historical context of Saul of Tarsus' encounter with Jesus, and then the subsequent conversion in Damascus. The second account, Luke records Paul's account before the council in Jerusalem. Notice Paul identifies the voice as Jesus of Nazareth an important detail for those Jews in Jerusalem to hear. Peter identifies the Savior the same way in Acts chapter 2 and verse 22 on the day of Pentecost. The third time this event is told, Paul is speaking to King Agrippa in Caesarea. Notice the emphasis that Paul puts on his mission from Jesus to take the message to the Gentiles. Remember, this occasion is not a gathering of Jews for a trial, but simply a time Festus desired Agrippa to hear Paul's case, so that he might know what to write to Rome about the case. But Paul knew Agrippa to be a Jew, albeit a secular one. Agrippa understood about the Messiah. Festus, on the other hand, was a Roman and only knew the politics of the case. Over and over, Paul will recount his early years of persecuting the church his heritage, his conversion, and mercy shown by God to him. He doesn't have to say verbatim each time he describes the event. We've seen this in the gospel accounts of Christ's ministry. Luke records Saul of Tarsus' conversion there in Damascus. Then he arose and was baptized. Paul tells in his own words the account in Acts 22.16. And now, why do you wait? Rise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. In the strictest sense, Saul was not converted on the road to Damascus. He is converted when he did what was required of him according to what the apostles taught from the very beginning on the day of Pentecost. We read in Acts chapter 2, verses 37 and 38. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. In both cases, there is a realization of guilt. But the remedy is clearly given. Baptism washes away guilt and sins. Read Romans chapter 6, verses 1-11, through 11, and see what Paul taught about baptism. Have you been washed in the blood of the Lamb? And Lord willing, let's meet here again tomorrow and look at more in the life of the Apostle Paul.